Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Boutillier, and I'm the principal of Magnuson School. Now we welcome Dr. Justin Davis, Dr. Braid Hale, Dr. Rick, pardon me, Rick Hansen, Dr. Gabor Mate, and Barbara Aerosmith Young to answer questions that have come up over the day. This discussion will be mediated by Howard Eaton. Please make your way to one of the microphones in the aisles um, to ask your questions. Thank you. So uh, there are a few rules. Uh, we're going to work with the left hemisphere for a little bit. Um, uh, just because we want to try to get through as many questions as possible, uh, best not to present a case study um, you know, that might last five minutes uh, in terms of um, response time. So if you have a question, uh, try to keep it short, uh, not too long, so we can respect uh, other people who might have questions uh, that are behind you. Uh, so we're going to start here uh, to my left. Uh, go ahead with your question. OK, first of all, as a parent and grandparent of uh, children with learning disabilities, I want to thank Howard Eaton and uh, the whole panel for presenting today. Uh, it has been so exhilarating for somebody as a parent who uh, struggled with this uh, years ago to see how far we've moved. And so my basic question to you is, how can we further this now that the, bo the ball has sort of started? Can we get the snowball running down the hill much faster? And how would you suggest that we go about doing this? Thank you. Uh, as well, if there's a particular speaker you want to ask, uh, go ahead and name the speaker too. But I'll let the panel uh, look at each other and say uh, who might want to answer that. <laughs> well, I, I'll take this one. Look, this I take it you're talking about the system, are you? Yes. Yeah, you're talking about the system. So there's two ways to look at the system. One is that it's failing, and the other is that it's succeeding. Now, whether it's succeeding or failing depends on what you assume its intentions are, what the built-in biases are, what the, what the hidden agenda may be, whether people are conscious of it or not. Now, if we assume that the uh, intention is to raise healthy, self-aware, mindful um, children who are curious, maturing, open to experience, uh, comfortable in themselves, confident toward the world, if we assume that that's the intention, the system is failing spectacularly. And the um, practices that are increasingly being entrenched under governmental pressure across North America, for example, the standardized testing, which utterly tramples on the dignity of the child and the child's um, capacity to learn and, 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 the, and the way children learn. Uh, so these practices that are bureaucratically de decreed that every teacher that you talk to knows doesn't work. These things are dominant. That's if we assume that the system has those intentions, then you can say the system is failing. However, if the hidden bias is the system is to bring up people who are um, capable of rote learning, who are not willing to challenge authority, who are willing to accept jobs and life situations that don't meet their needs, for security, connection, and uh, satisfaction, as Rick said, but who are dependent on external structures and authority figures and uh, who are willing to do, perform meaningless tasks, the system is succeeding spectacularly. <laughs> so I'm not going to say which assumption you should make. I'll, 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 <laughs> all I'm saying is that, that um, any sense of frustration that we have about it uh, actually ignores reality. So that the system is the way it is, it's like saying that the rain is wet. The rain is wet, that's the nature of the rain, and this is the nature of the system. Now, that means how do we approach that? Well, within the system, people are doing their jobs as they understand it. No point being upset about that. No point uh, being righteous about it. No point being frustrated about it. This is where it takes all the resources of mindfulness and resilience that Rick has been teaching us. We have to approach this with understanding, with patience, and even with compassion for the system itself and for the people working in it. And as much as possible, we have to manifest a different way of being. 
and trust that that will rub off. And those of us that are working with kids to actually subvert the system in a certain sense, to actually give them a different experience than the system might otherwise offer them. And I think that we have to trust in the fundamental uh, goodness and um, pr uh, unfolding capacity of human beings and human nature and just carry on with it without a sense of frustration, without a sense of rancor, without a sense of what's the use. That's the best thing I can tell you. Anybody on the panel like to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to add to something. Um, you know, it was interesting. When we uh, first came out with our first paper, uh, questioning response to intervention as a method of diagnosing learning disabilities in 2004, um, uh, we were told that uh, everyone, that what we represented was the past and not the future and that uh, the arguments we were presenting were ridiculous and we wanted to, uh, I actually got anonymous hate mail um, from people saying you want to harm children with your diagnoses and uh, RTI is about helping children and uh, so it was a lonely world in 2004 when we first wrote that paper uh, and people said that's not the trend, that's not the tide what you need to do is you need to jump on the bandwagon with the rest of us and help children. And that was 2004. In 2010, we had the late, some of the major players in learning disabilities uh, across North America uh, advocating our white paper. And a white paper is a testament of many professionals uh, that uh, advocate a certain position which was the position we advocated in 2004. So we went from a group of four people, myself, uh, Alan Kaufman, Jack Naglieri, and Ken Cavelli, uh, rest his soul, and um, four people to some of the major players in learning disabilities in 2010 writing the white paper. And if you Google my name and learning disabilities and white paper uh, from 2010, you'll see we came a long way. So I bring that up as a me measure of system change because sometimes it's important to recognize that if you have good ideas and you have persistence and you gain motivation among many people and the people in this room can come out, go out and do something to change the system, uh, you can do it. But you have to have the perseverance and the willingness to have the people, as, as was mentioned a minute ago, uh, who are going to say that's not relevant for what we do and uh, to do that you have to uh, you can do it mm -hmm. but the system will change people are recognizing the the changes that are happening and it's slow because it's comfortable what we know is what we know and as I talked about earlier it's much more comfortable to live in a, a world where we think we've got things mastered than the novelty that we are trying to instill upon you and upon the field uh, in recognizing the value of neuroscience and education. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question to my right. <laughs> Most people have addressed children because I know this is a conference with neuroplasticity and education, but many speakers throughout the day did speak a little bit about dementia and the elderly and I would invite any one of you to address a question regarding, I don't know, maybe since you're all doctors, prescriptions for um, change and does neurogenesis and neuroplasticity apply to those with dementia and if there's any papers or things you could tip us on that would be great. Anybody on the panel? Take a crack at this one. Uh, good question, and uh, it's really important, I think, that everybody understands that there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there is no effective treatment that's going to bring someone back who is on that neurodegenerative path. 
Uh, it's sad, it's unfortunate. If Dr. Senator were here, he'd be the one to answer this question. They're working hard at the UBC Brain Research Center to work on drug targets. Um, but I think the key message you should have taken today uh, from the conference was the one put forth by Dr. Rady. And that is that don't focus on cure, but focus on slowing down the trajectory and delaying the onset. And the way you do that is by simply adhering to the, I talked about it earlier this morning in the, about the five pillars, which is exercise first and foremost. It's never too late to start exercising. And to get to your point about um, neuroplasticity, does it still happen within the aging and the demented brain? To an extent, but there's nothing as plastic as the young infant brain. Uh, you know, the rate at which we grow and proliferate new neurons as we age does slow down. It still does happen. But uh, the only thing you can really do is delay the onset and slow the rate of decline through intervention. I'll say one more thing about that. I, in, in my book, When the Body Says No, I do uh, um, devote a chapter to dementia. It's no question to, in my mind that it's a consequence of lifelong stress. Uh, the first thing that you see in, uh, in Alzheimer's is, an, is the smallness of the hippocampus, which is the brain structure Dr. Hansen and I both talked about. It has to do with emotional processing, memory, and so on. It shrinks cortisol, the stress hormone, shrinks the hippocampus. And so that, uh, and, and that stress goes back to early childhood experiences very often. And that, I'm not going to go into how and that why, but that's the case. Conversely, even though somebody is demented, you can see terrific variation in functioning in his people, depending on the emotional environment in which they live. Are they allowed to paint and express themselves? Are they offered opportunities to play? Are they offered opportunities to listen to music? Mm -hmm. Are there warm, emotionally connected interactions in which they can engage? All these things make a huge difference to their experience of life. Even if it doesn't reverse the dementia, their experience of life is entirely different. And what we do in our society is, is we sequester and isolate these people. And uh, rather than giving them what they need, uh, we tend to deprive them of what they need. And then we wonder at their cognitive decline and we wonder at their um, poor quality of life. Uh, next speaker to my left. Okay, I'm a psychiatrist and I've been doing a lot of uh, study in, um, in neurofeedback. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it seems one of the most exciting um, treatments available now and becoming more and more known. Um, I want to thank everyone for a very stimulating conference and uh, I'm really excited by all the ideas. But I just wanted, uh, wondered if somebody could comment on that because I feel that that's the one thing that's been missing and should have been talked about. Next year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have it next year, a neurobiofeedback uh, person, as well as nutrition next year. Uh, speaker, anybody who'd like to address neurobiofeedback? Maybe that's missing. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I can speak to it. Um, so neurofeedback is, it is an old science, so it uses one of the oldest imaging technologies we have out there, which is EEG, literally. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, you put electrodes on the brain that are like microphones that are capable of listening to the pattern of electrical activity in different regions of the brain. And based on that, you're able to get applications and programs that respond to the signals in the brain. And based on how you think and how you feel, you will drive those programs and get visual or perhaps auditory feedback um, to help you modify the ways in which you think. And it has proven effective in a lot of clinical settings. Uh, it takes a long time. So in, for those people who, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Swingle, he's probably the biggest name in the lower mainland. Uh, the clinics are out there, they work if you commit to it. Uh, it's expensive, uh, unfortunately, at this point. So for teachers and educators and a lot of families, that's a bit of a barrier to entry. Uh, but if done properly, it can work for some people. Uh, for other people, it may not work. But if it's something that you think you can derive benefit from, especially people who are you know, needing to learn a little bit more about how to pay attention or a little bit more about how to calm their anxiety, it is an effective tool. So I encourage if there's any other comments or suggestions on the efficacy or the value of neurofeedback, please don't hesitate to take the conversation further. 
Well, I'll just add briefly that uh, I think that um, there's a lot of potential yeah. in, in uh, neurofeedback, uh, and there's a lot of controversy. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, this is, I think, a testament uh, to what we advocate in our field. We may believe very strongly about a particular perspective or orientation or practice. Um, what undermines us sometimes is not conducting the empirical research to make that a reality. And so uh, that's one of the problems with neurofeedback um, is that some of the biggest proponents are those who have uh, relied on, um, uh, have not provided the empirical investigation to support it. And empirical investigation is not the answer, let me also say, uh, across all aspects of evidence. I mean, evidence is collected in multiple ways and multiple types of resources. So although bio, uh, neurofi uh, neurofeedback is controversial, it certainly has an opportunity to be a, a, a technique that could be useful. But what we need is more empirical evidence to support it. Wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Hale's statements. Thank you. Over to my right. Hi. I was uh, very interested in um, Dr. Hansen's discussion on mindfulness and how, when he took us through some of the practices. However, I just had a question about what would you do, um, or maybe some suggestions, if you had a child who had a, a significant amount of trauma in their life and you were asking them to remember a happy memory and to get that feeling in their body about feeling good, what would you suggest to do for a child who might not be able to retrieve that kind of memory because of significant trauma in their life? How would you take them through that so that they could get that good feeling when perhaps they hadn't had it before? Um, well, first, uh, I'd want to have compassion for that child, of course, and or you know, nurturance as a parent, let's say, or as a teacher. And I think um, I have a, ultimately a lot of faith in our profoundly social nature as, as a species. And even if that child is not showing any evidence of registering our own care and compassion, I think uh, our care and compassion still matters, even if there's no immediate result. Point one. Point two, um, there are many ways to have a positive experience, that first stage of learning, right? Uh, how do we get the fire going? One way is, of course, to pull up a memory of some kind or another. That's a very legitimate way to do it. It's striking to me how many people pull up memories or experiences with their dog or cat or other, family or other animals uh, from adulthood or childhood as a real comfort experience for themselves. But there are many other ways, including just simply um, helping children who are in the moment of having a positive experience of some kind. They've accomplished something. They're simply <sighs> exhaling. Exhaling, as others know, stimulates the parasympathetic wing of the nervous system, slows down the heart, and promotes a bit of a relaxation response. Just registering that alone. Um, is extremely valuable. Um, mom, uh, little experiences of, of getting something done, being a hammer instead of a nail, choosing salt or pepper to put on your scrambled eggs in the morning. That's an opportunity again for an experience. Uh, noticing something good inside yourself, that you're caring, that you're decent, you're enduring, you're patient, what have you. So one thing that has come out for me in thinking about this is the fundamental principle of resourcefulness. I've been a therapist a long time, and it's made me, I think, kinder. My wife says so. So that's really how you know. You know what I mean? It's the people you live with, right? That's the real, you know. They say in monasteries, if you want to if you think you're so enlightened, go home for the holidays, right? You know? But anyway, my, my point is that it's also made me much more focused on traditional character values of effort, you know, effort. Uh, we can't do anything about where we are, but we can do a lot about where we go from here, right? And is a person resourceful or not? So now all that said, just to wrap up, another thing that has struck me a lot, including in this little model that Dr. Matei and I both kind of talked about, you know, in my simplification, the inner lizard, mouse, and monkey, reptilian, mammalian, primate systems. In terms of those ancient systems, the more wounded someone is, the more traumatized they are, the younger at uh, the age at which the wound occurred, the more you're dealing with fundamental ancient systems. And as you do that, two things are true. One, the more you deal with 
increasingly fundamental in ancient systems, the more they load on that primal experience of fear. We are a bunch of scared monkeys. We're scared of each other, we're scared of life, we're scared of not succeeding, we're scared of so many things. And children especially are very frightened. And there's so much in this world, um, as Gabor talked about a moment ago, that's not supportive of their true nature. And it's frightening for them. There's so many alarm signals, right? And we're very vulnerable to threat experiences. So the more traumatized or the younger the age at which something has happened, the more it's important to really support primal experiences of safety, of protection, as well as inner strength in terms of dealing with the threats in life. And the second thing is to appreciate is that as you go down in the brain, you go back in time. And as you go down the brain and back in time, neuroplasticity decreases. Which means, in other words, that as it were, the inner monkey, metaphorically speaking, is a fairly quick learner. The inner mouse, eh, kind of slow. The lizard needs a lot of petting, a lot of experiences of safety, reassurance, calming, relaxing, settling, soothing, etc., that are really primal. So out of that, in terms of thinking about the, the more distressed or disturbed groups in the population, it takes me down into primal experiences of there is enough air, um, what it's like to drink water when you're thirsty, simple experiences of physical pleasure, feeling of flannel or the softness, or being with an animal that loves you, or eating something sweet, you know, tasting something good. Those are all opportunities, even with severely disturbed or traumatized people, for fundamental experiences that are, that are positive that then become, can become building blocks for people that you can work with from the inside out. You know, there's some evidence in the field, it's controversial, that catastrophic trauma for catastrophically vulnerable infants or young people can be permanently damaging. I think it's possible. But I'm on the side of the therapists who rush in where angels fear to tread. You know, and teachers as well. I think there's a special place in heaven for educators, personally. And um, I think it's an heroic undertaking. And we should never, ever, ever doubt, including now increasingly substantiated by hardcore neuroscience, we should never, ever, ever doubt the capacity of the human heart, the human spirit, to change things for the better. Yeah, do you know, um, it was in that. Actually, if I could build on that just one second. And I think so much of what we offer our children, our friends, our family, our clients, our compadres, other people in life, is our own demonstration of that we don't give up. You know, I'm a Lord of the Rings sci-fi geek, and I just think about Sam hanging out with Frodo on the slopes of Mount Doom, just crawling up there, you know, lava coming down, all this bad stuff that they know that in we, I talked to this mom after my talk, who just did not give up on her kid. And the feeling that you've got a friend, you've got a partner who will not give up on you. We may be, we may be tired, we may be thwarted, but we have not given up. And that's so important for kids and others to register uh, that they have allies with them. It was, uh, you, you're at Berkeley, right? Yes. Uh, did you know Marion Diamond there? I know of her, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so Marion Diamond is the one that did these famous rat experiments where they took rats at different ages, uh, different ages, um, and even deliberately brain damaged some rats at birth. And then they expose them to different levels of environmental stimulation, contact, nutrition, play, space, and so on. And they found that all the rats at any age, and even the brain damaged ones, uh, developed not only better habits, but also on autopsy, larger nerve cells in their frontal cortex with more connections and richer blood supply. And her comment was just to echo what Rick is saying, is that you never give up on any human being. That's what she said. Or a rat. Or, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the only thing I would add to Rick's comments is that when you ask about how to help this child, now as a therapist myself or as a physician working with traumatized people, the question that I always have to be asking myself is how am I reacting to them? So what is your level of frustration when that child isn't getting it? Because if you get frustrated because they're not getting your love, your frustration is not with them. Your frustration is at yourself or at the perceived intractability of the situation. But any frustration that's generated inside you will be interpreted by them as being about them. And that'll be, that'll be shutting down their capacity to receive the positive that you're actually giving them. So I think that we have to be extraordinarily mindful 
the more mo the traumatized the people or the children that we're working with, the more mindful we have to have we have to be of our own internal states, because they can be picking up on our emotional cues, not on what we're saying, and they're going to internalize them and, and personalize them and think that they're being rejected, they're being criticized, they're being um, they're being somehow um, rejected, and we're, 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 that's not our intention at all. And I. I have personal experience with that, and I, and I know what it's like to be in one state, and what the impact is that on, on the people I'm working with, and what it's like to be in a higher state, and what the impact of that is. But that takes a lot of mindfulness work internally for all of us engaged in dealing with vulnerable people. Thank you. Uh, to my left. <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut speaker talk back. You guys. <laughs> So, Derek Luke from the University of Calgary, and this question is directed to all the speakers, is that what would education look like where students are provided the skill not just for a life of tests, but for the tests of life? Could you say it one more time? <laughs> what would education look like where students are provided the skills not for a life of tests, but for the tests of life? I think I can I'll start. Um, I mean, I think in, in obviously the work that I do is with, with individuals that have cognitive deficits and significant learning disabilities and, you know, who are very traumatized by just having to be tested because what those tests are showing is in lots of ways they, they aren't measuring up to whatever that, um, that standard is. And, and I think, you know, in all of what, what we've heard here is really starting with where the individual is, like starting with, you know, um, sort of where their you know, uniqueness is, you know, whether it is in the strengths and in, in the weaknesses and kind of having a compassionate um, understanding and empathy and validation of, of who they are as unique beings. So that to me is, is the first beginning place. And then certainly what I've seen through, you know, the work that I've been involved in for a lot of years now um, is the you know resilience in in these individuals and in the incredible ability of the brain to change through very specific and positive and targeted cognitive stimulation um, which then ultimately prepares them for life because certainly a big part of what mediates our experience in the world is our cognitive functioning um, and every you know any kind of limitation or deficit will will have an impact. So, I mean, one thing I would love to see is every child starting in grade one, um, that part of the day would be mindfulness, um, and part of the day would be cognitive programming designed to, you know, stimulate cognitive function and harness what we know about neuroplasticity, and part of the day would be learning curriculum, because really, what, what do we learn with? We learn with, with our brain, and we, as we heard today, we need to feel safe in in, in our um, environment. So, I mean, to me, that would be, if I, I could, you know, take a paintbrush and paint what I'd like to see in education, that's what I would like to see. And I think what would happen was, would be that the, the stigma that gets associated, these children that get identified at around grade three would never be identified because cognitive programming would just be a natural part of their, um, their daily experience, it would just be a normal experience. And I think every child can benefit from, from cognitive stimulation and from you know, mindfulness um, training as well. So that, that, would be, that would be what I would like to, to see happen. Anyone else on the panel like to yeah, answer that? In. You know, I think one of the biggest problems that we've run into in the past is generalizability. I mean, that's what the, the uh, person who was questioning uh, the panel uh, was really referring to. How do we generalize what we're training or working on in individual classrooms or in behavior management or therapy sessions to the real world? Um, and that is a major issue. Matter of fact, one of the things that we can create is such an artificial environment that's segregated from the rest of the, the world that it doesn't generalize. And we see this over and over again in traditional models where we're pulling kids out of the natural environment 
to do our individual work with, and they may be fine when they're one-on-one -on -one with us, but then how do we go out and have them do that in the regular classroom or the playground or the department store or the restaurant? How do we generalize the, those, those skills? And I think one of the things that we should focus on is empowerment empowerment of the children to take control of their own interventions and their own efforts and their own self-awareness. I find it amazing how many children, often I'm called in, uh, I, I don't, I'm a professor and mostly do research, but I do some clinical practice to keep my skills intact and I often get um, expert witness kinds of evaluations. But whenever I do see a kid and I start talking to them, I say, you know, and they've been evaluated before they come to me, and uh, the, I ask them, so why is it you have problems learning? What, what is it? And a majority of the kids say, I don't know. Or worse, they say, I'm dumb. And that's a sad statement for what we're doing as adults, I think, with children. Because what we need to do is we need to help them recognize what is their strength, what is their weakness, what are their limitations, what are, the, what are their capacities for self-control and self-determination. Because it does no good to provide an artificial, constricted environment where we segregate children. Uh, from the rest of the world and then say, okay, now you're 18, you're on your own. Go off and do your thing. Because I've seen the ramifications of this happen where we get kids then several years down the road sinking like rocks because no one ever taught them to generalize outside, the, outside of this artificial contrived environment. So that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, one of the things, and I might get some of the people in here mad at me for saying this, but who are the primary therapists in a kid's life? Who are the primary people that help these kids? And that's the teacher in their regular classroom, and that's the parent. So the more we can do to get them to be the primary therapist and then the children to really engage, hopefully, as they develop the skills and competency to handle it, uh, to be self-determined in their own therapeutic progress and get control uh, of themselves in a way that they feel like they're the number one people in their lives who can invoke change. And so how we do that, we need a lot of research in that area. But the other way which we've had a tr tendency to do, which is, is take control of them in the intervention efforts, uh, I think undermines our ultimate goal to lead them to an autonomous, uh, self-directed uh, experience in the real world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentleman to my right. Uh, this is uh, more advertisement. Uh, I push two fields, heart math and energy psych, and I have written up a proposal here that I would like to have people have. It's, there's about 50 or 60 copies here, and I have, I'm, uh, I'm being controlled by the, the parking police, okay? Uh, I have to go and, get, and move out. But anyway, I'm gonna leave these here for people, and I've, I've found that people don't know about, for, much heart, for the most part, heart math uh, approaches to things, and they're getting at very many similar things that uh, everybody here is talking about. I know Rick has uh, mentioned this in his book, uh, Buddha, Buddha, but uh, it comes out of the heart rate variability um, studies, and heart rate variability is one of the primary and best predictors of all cause problems, physical and mental, right? And so if you can control that through the heart, and giving the heart coherence and peace and love and so on. You focus on the heart and all this stuff can more rapidly, I think, uh, resolve itself, right? So that's my pitch here. And if you want to read my proposal, it's over here. I'll leave it on the chair because I have to leave. And uh, well, that's all I have to say, okay? Thank you. Is there think a speaker, the any speaker would like to 
address that? The, um, the person, uh, I believe, I, Rick didn't mention him by name, I did quote him once that the scientist, the psychologist who did a lot of the w research on heart rate variability, its connection to the vagus nerve, which is an important autonomic nerve in the body, uh, it, it's that the connection of that to safety and the triune brain, the reptilian um, mammalian, and then the higher mammalian brain, is actually Stephen Porges, and his polyvagal theory. You must be familiar with his work, and uh, um, so certainly there seems to be a lot of science. I don't fully understand what is it that you do, but. Um, what you're referring to, there's certainly a lot of science behind it, and I would guess that you're quoting him as well. Uh, whether you mention him by name or not, I'm not sure. Well, thank you. And anyone who'd like to get information, it's on the chair uh, where he's uh, located. Thank you, sir. Uh, lady to the my left. Well, first off, I find it incredibly inspiring that the connections between neuroplasticity and education are being widely recognized and discussed. And um, as an educator, I have a question uh, primarily for Dr. Hale, but open for the entire panel. Um, as an educator, I would love to incorporate the neuroscience into my daily curriculum. So I was just wondering, how can we implement this into a daily routine? Um, what is the game plan for revolutionizing education as we know it and helping our students reach their full potential in ways we never have before? Thank you. Dr. Hale? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, you know, I think that uh, we, we need a multi-pronged approach. One of the things that uh, is going to be important is that individuals such as yourself uh, who are committed to uh, incorporating um, these ideas into your daily instruction and routine that you read as much as you can. One of the things that I usually encourage people to do uh, who attend my workshops and conferences and so forth is um, to just go into Google, go to Google Scholar and type in the word brain and reading, brain and math, brain and writing. Uh, brain in depression, brain in anxiety, and just kind of get familiar with the literature. Um, I think that there's many books that are now coming out there that can also help as a resource. I think, so one is personal education and, and thinking about that. If you, I mean, if you think of some of the things we've heard about mindfulness today, how can you be brainfulness? You know, I mean, how can you kind of start to think of how you interact with people, the things you do? One of the things that I do in my, when I teach neuroanatomy, of all things, is, and, and, and it's kind of a combination of neuroanatomy and neuropsychology, uh, is I have people uh, as, as a last, one of the last assignments in the course, is to take a normal everyday activity and dissect it in terms of what brain functions are going on. Because once you start, so something as simple as making a, a cup of coffee or brushing your teeth or having a conversation with a friend. And you know, think of the different brain areas involved. And once you start to think like that, you can translate that on a fairly regular basis to what you're doing in a classroom to the types of patterns you're seeing in a child, or the, the interpretation of the tests you use, or the measures you use, or the worksheets you use. So if you start to think in terms of what brain areas are involved as I'm communicating to you right now, what bra brain areas are involved, you know, I have certain frontal areas involved, I have certain temporal areas involved, I'm using certain motor cortices, I've got some cerebellar activity going on, uh, you know, I mean, I can kind of get to that point. So it's a part of it is an individual education. The second part is educating people who may be resistant to that kind of information because it's novel, it's hard. You know, it's, it's really, neuroscience is kind of a double whammy in many ways because not only do you not know about it, so that's the first kind of like 
not that you don't know about it, but you know, some people just don't have, went through all their schooling and never heard about the brain. So the first whammy against you is like, uh, do I really need to know this? And then the second one is that, boy, this is hard. <laughs> Why don't we just say this little piece of the brain does this, and little piece of the brain does that? And so, you know, you have to kind of get awareness increase. So the more you can get uh, people involved uh, using user-friendly types of things, but not faddish things, because that's the other problem we run into, is that you have a lot of people who say or purport to have neuroscience-based educational um, training or teaching going on, and then you go to these things and you hear things that really aren't quite that accurate. So uh, it's important to get knowledge, but also knowledge that is accurate. One of the best ways to overcome resistance in a consultation relationship, for a professional consultation relationship, is to provide literature. I can tell you all day of how I think neuropsychology is important, but one of the best things is to provide evidence, so provide documentation to kind of get past that resistance. I think the third level is how do you do the systems level change that's necessary to bring uh, uh, psycho neuropsychology, neuroscience into education. And one of the things is creating an infrastructure. That, uh, matter of fact, I had the privilege of um, going on a hike at a conference with one of the leaders of one of our professional organizations. And he said, you know, Brad, a lot of people like what you have to say. You have good ideas. And many people think that it's an important thing to do. However, the infrastructure doesn't exist. And so without an infrastructure, you really are limited in professing what you do because there's no capacity to handle it. So the capacity needs to be built. So what we need is many more, I think, at the college level, us and people who are professors advocating for neuroscience in education programs. And what we have a tendency to do, I work with a lot of neuroscientists in the medical school. And those neuroscientists lead very kind of ins insular types of lives. I said, you need to go out and teach the educators. They say, well, the educators don't want to hear it. But that kind of interdisciplinary connectedness to see that we have shared values and shared beliefs and shared opinions breaks down those artificial barriers that undermines our ability to do what we call translational science. Translating the science into the field. And so that takes people like you in this room to say, let me learn about the brain, now let me help translate that to my other fellow teachers and educators and psychologists and other allied professionals so that it becomes the buzzword. How do we learn about the brain? Because like I said earlier, teaching is changing brain functioning. And if we had every teacher at least acknowledge that, I think that would be a great first step. So that's simple enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We have uh, 10 minutes left, uh, so I'm gonna, we have three people who want to ask questions, so I'm going to keep it to those three. Uh, speakers realize we have 10 minutes left, uh, so uh, check your answers, see if you can condense some of them if, if possible. So, lady to my right. Hi. Um, oh, gentleman to my right, sorry. Hello. Long hair. Uh, <laughs> Uh, like my glasses need change. With some very notable exceptions, uh, not to be diminished, the picture painted by most of the talks about the education system is rather bleak. What would you, I'm a neuroscientist, not an educator, so I don't know the education side very well, but it seems that there needs to be a very significant policy shift at a very high level to realize the kinds of changes that you want to see, that we want to see as sort of the choir here. What would you say is the source of these issues, these problems, the sort of over-prescription medication, the nomothetic model, you name it? And 
how do we address that, those causes through policy? Well, first of all, um, we have to distinguish between the system and the people working in it. Uh, I speak a lot to teachers and committed, engaged people who actually want to love their kids and, and want to give them a, a safe environment. Then there is the system. And whether you work in a medical system as a nurse or uh, in the education system as a, a teacher, there's often a tremendous frustration between the, your intentions and your intuition and what the system encourages you or wants you or allows you to do. So um, I think a conference like this, where there's so many of you showed up today and, and, and the Howard Eaton School went to tremendous lengths to organize it, this would not have happened 10 years ago. So that itself is a sign of the disconnect between what's happening and what we know and what we would like to happen. So my faith is not so much in the system, but is in the people in it. Number one, number two, unfortunately, the policymakers don't tend to show up at events like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, w whether I, uh, I'm addressing medical issues or drug policy issues, uh, we have this we had dinner last night, and I think Rick made this statement, but somebody did, this business of evidence-based um, practices. We have this slogan of evidence-based practice, but we don't see it anywhere. I don't see evidence-based practice in medicine. I don't see it in education, because the evidence, for example, around standardized testing is against it, and yet everywhere school boards are imposing them. Uh, when it comes to bullying policies, there's a one review that said, zero tolerance, zero evidence. <laughs> but that doesn't stop school boards from engaging in, 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 in zero tolerance policies. So I don't know how to address that question. I don't know that there's an answer, except that this conference and others that we've been at and, and, and all the speakers today uh, and, and, and the fact that you're here, it all speaks to, um, to the uh, malleability, the plasticity of the human brain, to the capacity of the human heart to aspire to something higher. And that's where we need to put the effort into supporting people doing what they would love to do. And the system, well, it'll have to change in its own pace. I'll just add something briefly. Uh, I, I think that one of the things that could really be great, you know, as neuropsychologists or neurologists or neuroscientists, we tend to write for each other. And we try to impress each other <laughs> with so much jargon. I mean, you know, when you see people talk about the basal ganglia, for instance, they talk about the basal ganglia, the striatal complex, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the um, corpus striatum, you know, I mean, why not call it the same damn thing? Uh, we're all talking about the basal ganglia, although the striatum doesn't include the globus pallidus, so okay, don't get mad at me. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is, if we could do the translational piece, that would be a key way to change things. Because we make our stuff inaccessible. When I wrote School Neuropsychology the first time, they said, the editors told me, make it accessible and make it straightforward. And I did that. You know, I wrote about the whole brain in a chapter. You know, and then they still said, this is too complex. Okay, and so they made, they, we did these call-out boxes. So the more complex stuff, like the M&P pathways and stuff like that, went out in these call-out boxes. So I said, finally, we're, you know, okay, we're finally at a place that's accessible. And then I heard someone tell me at a conference the other day it was the most complex book they ever read. <laughs> and I'm going like, holy moly, I mean, I don't know how we can do this. But being able to kind of translate the science into stuff that, people can use. And maybe what we need is, uh, when we're writing our books, because we think we're all accessible, uh, is, you know, get, uh, what do you call them, those think panels or whatever, uh, you know, the focus, groups. focus groups, to s thank you, uh, 
uh, retrieval problem. Uh, to to actually say how accessible is this? How how meaningful is this to a parent or a teacher or or someone else? So that's a possibility. Or before each chapter, you can say, "Go for a run before you read this." There you go. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go to this lady here. She's just been waiting a bit longer, so we have a about four or five minutes. So I want to uh, make sure I get to the last question. Sorry, it's also for uh, Dr. Hale. You had mentioned about. Uh, if, you, if you're told about evaluating or assessing your child at grade three, it's too late. Um, we, my husband and I actually came from Winnipeg for this, t for this conference today, and could you just expand on that a little bit? And the other part of that is, how do we get that changed? Because that's exactly our experience. Uh, thanks. Um, I, I think that one of the things we have to do is we need to kind of think, uh, Part of the problem is one, and I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail given the limited amount of time, but uh, American psychology and neuropsychology has been very number focused. And uh, I was trained uh, in part in Eastern neuropsychology uh, under the guy, uh, you know, under the efforts and, and teachings of A.R. Luria. And I think that we can practice neuropsychology at a very early age. Uh, if we start to just pay attention to what kids do and what they say and what they give us on writing and, and drawing and so forth. And so too many people are tied to, well, we can't get the right numbers until third grade. And so what we need to put an emphasis on is, is clinical training. And, uh, you know, at a time, unfortunately, when society is pushing us to more and more numbers and standardized tests and computerized tests to cut down on costs, we're actually going the opposite direction. So what, what we need is some systematic studies that really shows that um, we make a lot of false diagnoses. And those diagnoses continue on in a kid's life until you get someone to come along and go like, wait a minute, why does everybody keep saying the same thing? And does this diagnosis really help us understand what's going on with the individual? So there's a lot of issues that are at, 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 at stake here. But I think one of the biggest problems, or one of the things that you could talk about with your uh, service providers, is the fact is that doing the wrong thing over and over again is practicing the wrong thing, not only in terms of doing it behaviorally, but it's hardwiring it into the brain. And so uh, in our chapter in our APA book, chapter 13, we talk about this hardwiring and actually making the problem more significant over time by not doing the kinds of early intervention and identification we need. Finally. Uh, response to intervention approaches, although I'm strongly against it for diagnostic purposes, can help monitor children early on to identify the need for additional, uh, more sophisticated evaluation. So I think we should advocate for it so that we're monitoring kids' progress in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and so forth. Thanks. Thank you. We have uh, one more question. Uh, after this question, uh, one or two speakers will answer it. And I just want to uh, have a five minutes just to thank people who are involved in the conference. Uh, so I hope you stay around to give them applause. So uh, one more question and uh, we'll go to thanks. So my question is related to the fitness um, discussions that were earlier and I know those people aren't here on the panel but perhaps someone else could help me. I couldn't quite clarify for myself. It said as fitness standards increase, so as we become more fit, so do the test scores. and. <laughs> with the, the risk of offending people, you know that stereotype of the dumb jock and um, some other people that are out there. Um, I'm an athlete myself, so I can say things like that. We have met people that um, are clearly beyond gifted athletically. And I would suggest um, when you have a conversation with them, it does not appear that their test scores would be at the same level as their athletic prowess. Um, or, you know, like you mentioned about being a geek or the Sheldon nerdy type that we picture of, you know, locked in a corner, can't catch a ball, can't, you know, those old stereotypes that are out there. Unfortunately, I've met people from both categories. And so I just can't get my head around 
the increase, is it an increase, a relative increase in cognitive ability, or is it overall? Do you know what I'm asking? Does that well, make sense to you? I think you're dealing with I, I populations as I well. Working, so. I think you're working too hard here. Okay? Help me. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing. Like, this thing about the dumb jock, well, I'm not sure I want to buy into it, but first of all, what you don't know is how, d how much dumber might that jock be if he hadn't exercised, okay? That's the... <laughs> That's the, that, that, that's the first question, okay? The second issue is, of course, you can't isolate any one of these parameters and say this is the decisive one. What I, you know, I, uh, Rick talked about mindfulness. Um, Barbara's talk I didn't hear, but I know what she says about identifying cognitive issues and addressing them specifically. Um, I'm talking about the emotional, uh, the necessity for emotional safety. John Rady talked about uh, fitness, exercise. These are all inputs that are necessary. So you can't isolate one and say, if you achieve the maximum with this one, therefore you're gonna have the maximum effect. So that's what I mean that you're working too hard. You're working too hard to put everything into one basket here. So I think we have to have a broader approach. And again, my original comment that it's all relative to that individual. How would that person be doing without that? So I don't, I don't think you, your question is a good one, but I don't think it's as complex as necessarily you make it out to be. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say, can I say so one, one quick thing? Okay. I, 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 feel, <laughs> I feel like I need to say this. One of the things uh, about the dumb jock thing that we need to really think seriously about is the uh, terrible epidemic we have of concussion in many sports. And what we're finding is that there's a significant number of people who, you know, uh, the belief was that people could have concussions and not have significant long-term effects. Uh, and that's just not the case. So I, I would encourage you, while you're thinking about the athletic issues, to uh, wonder about the ramifications of some of the contact sports. Hockey is very popular here. I love hockey, football, uh, soccer even. There's even been research that shows that heading the ball can lead to permanent long-term brain damage. So I think we need to kind of step a little bit into that arena in terms of understanding that we need to guard against uh, significant concussion in our children. Yeah. And of course, I'm just going to clarify as everyone gasped when I said those words. We all know they're stereotypes. I was just trying to key in on the issue. Yeah. Thank you. Great uh, we're looking for a head injury speaker for next year as well. So some neurobio feedback, some more uh, Mate, some more Hanson. Uh, we're going to have a real fun time next year. Uh, I just want to do some quick thank yous. I want to thank uh, and show and take in the good of the staff at the Western Bayshore. Uh, they are smiling every time you see them. They're just amazing. So. I just really appreciate what they've done and the type of people they are, and they surely show the gratitude all the time to us. And it's rare to see that in a corporation, in a, in a business, and their systems are down pat, the people are just remarkable. I also want to thank the people behind the scenes, the parents who helped us, uh, students who may have assisted us, all the staff from Eaton Aerosmith Schools to Magnuson School to Eaton Cognitive Improvement Center, who've uh, worked tirelessly to assist uh, the main coordinator of this event and someone I want to have stand up and take in some good, Sandra Husel, for organizing this event. I'm supposed to have some flowers to give you, but they're not here right now, so, so let's fake it. <laughs> You'll get some in the mail, no, no. Uh, uh, especially, of course, all the speakers. Uh, thank you very much. And lastly, my gratitude from all of us, uh, the speakers, the staff, the staff at the Western Bayshore, thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to share uh, your brain with us and acquire new knowledge and take it out into the world and have an influence, be enablers. I know I will help you. If you want help, give me a call. Uh, but thank you for being here and help, 
helping and sharing this journey of bringing neuroscience into education. So thank you yourself. And thank you, Howard. Yes. Enjoy the evening. Is it foggy still? Oh, yeah. <laughs>